I would now like to invite our um, chief guest, Honorable Mr. Justice L. Nageshwar Rao, to, to speak to the audience. To two colleagues uh, in different capacity, all of us were uh, together as traditional solicitor generals. General. My teacher, guide, and philosopher, Mr. Soli Swaraji, General Narendra Kumar, ladies and gentlemen and students. I deem it a privilege to be here to speak on uh, the occasion of celebrations of the birth uh, centenary of uh, Nani Patkiwala. A genius and uh, the lawyer bar excellence. Instead of my telling you about him, I thought uh, I'll read from the citation that was given when he was uh, presented the Doctor of Laws by the Princeton University in New Jersey. Defender of constitutional liberties, champion of human rights, he has courageously advanced his conviction that expediency in the name of progress at the cost of freedom is no progress at all but retrogression. Lawyer, teacher, author, and economic developer, he brings to us as ambassador of India intelligent good humor experience and vision for international understanding. Not knowing that Mr. Surabji would be here, I also wrote from an article written by him on Palkiwala. I thought this paragraph was, is very apt. Mr. Surabji says, there have been lawyers who matched Palkiwala in erudition and legal knowledge. But for sheer advocacy, Palkiwala was unsurpassable. Clarity of thought coupled with precision and elegance of expression. Impassioned plea for the cause he has posed in the case. Excellent court craft and an extraordinary ability to think on his legs rendered him an irresistible force and made him too generous. And now regarding the topic, dignity, I was reading an article written by Palkiwala Constitution and the common man, and this is what he said. The essential purpose of a constitution is to ensure freedom of the individual and the dignity of man, and to put basic human rights out of the reach of the state and of transient politicians in power whose naked juvenile chatter is covered by the fig leaf of demagogic uh, claptrap. When I was reading this article, during the same time I was approached to speak today and I thought, why not speak on dignity, which was very close to the heart of Nani Palkiwala. And uh, that's how I chose this topic of dignity. You heard uh, Mr. Kaul and the uh, Solicitor General tell you about what dignity is and how dignity has developed over the years and the court's contribution to the development of uh, dignity. Human dignity as a constitutional value is the humanity of each person as a human being. Human dignity can be seen in the background of social, religious, and philosophical lines. But we are today trying to find out what is human dignity in the constitutional context? There are two fundamental constitutional situations. One, dignity as a constitutional value. And two, dignity as a constitutional value as well as a constitutional right. Dignity as a constitutional value can be expressed Dignity as a constitutional value can also be implied. Dignity as a constitutional value have expressly been stated in some constitutions, like the German constitution, where Article 1 starts with by saying that dignity is inviolable. And the German constitution has a provision where this provision cannot be amended. 
we have the constitution of Spain, which also embeds dignity in the constitution itself as a value. And you have a South African constitution, which also speaks of inviolable dignity as a value. So these are constitutions which recognize dignity as a constitutional value. And there are other constitutions like the Bill of Rights of the American Constitution. You have the Canadian Constitution which also has this Bill of Rights and our own Constitution which does not expressly recognize the, the dignity as a constitutional value. You have heard the speakers who spoke before me tell you about the preamble where dignity has been mentioned. Preamble, as you all know, as people connected to law, is also part of the constitution of the Keshwanandabharti. And preamble, along with the fundamental rights and the directive principles, forms the trinity of the constitution. And preamble is also taken into account not only for the interpretation of statutes which are made under the constitution, but for interpretation of the constitution as well. And apart from the mention in the preamble, there are directive principles which mention about the dignity. Article 39 refers to dignity, especially 39F. And Article 51, which is a fundamental duty, also refers to dignity of women. And if you read the entire Article 39, it refers to the dignity of an individual from A to F. Though it's not expressly covered as a constitutional right, it is definitely recognized as a constitutional value in the, in the Indian constitution. What if there is a conflict between uh, two values of uh, human dignity? How is it that they are going to be solved? Arun Barak refers to this dignity as a mother right. And he says all other rights pertaining to freedom of expression, liberty, movement, association are all daughter rights. And then he says you look into them as a basket right, as they refer to in the German constitution. If you have a basket of rights, there is no question of any conflict between a right which is specifically mentioned and a value which is the value of human dignity. And they cannot, there can be an explicit reading into the constitution of this uh, dig, uh, dignity as a constitutional value by taking into account the background in which the constitution is made. You look into the history of the society and then you look into the constitution as a whole for the purpose of finding out whether there are other external sources for you to come to a conclusion that human dignity is a value that is accepted by the constitution. And an internal reading of the constitution also, which is an implicit reading of the constitution where you say that human dignity is a constitutional value. If it is a constitutional value, whether it takes into its fold all other fundamental rights which have been specifically mentioned in the constitution and how do you read human dignity into the constitution would be the next question. If this is the underlying right, human dignity is the underlying right, all other rights would be falling within this underlying right. As and when you interpret uh, say in uh, India, Article 14, you're looking at some problem which comes to court and there's a, there's a complaint of violation of an Article 14 or an Article 19 or Article 21. Whenever you're looking at those rights which have been specifically mentioned, the human value of dignity is also taken into account. How did it all started? Let us uh, uh, go back and then uh, look at uh, a judgment uh, which was a dissenting judgment of uh, Justice Field in Mann versus Illinois. It was actually a property right case where uh, the warehouse of uh, the person who went to court was acquired and then there was a dispute pertaining to compensation. 
and uh, the majority held that the compensation that was paid uh, cannot be said to be meagre. The warehouse that was built uh, can be used by the public and the government uh, has an imminent interest in acquisition of the property. No complaint can be made about the acquisition and the compensation that was made. Justice Field, while dissenting, said that the life of a man is not mere animal existence. It is something more than animal existence. This is what was followed by Justice uh, Bhagavati in a case which was mentioned by uh, Mr. Cowell, pertaining to the rights of persons who were detained in custody, saying that the life of an individual is something more than uh, animal existence is what was taken into account and dignity was recognized as a part of the uh, fundamental rights that are there in our constitution. Going a little back before 1944 when Mann versus Illinois was decided, there was uh, another case where dignity was used in the judgment by Justice Murphy in his dissent again in a case which is called Koramatsu versus uh, US. Koramatsu was a Japanese who was uh, living in the Bay Area in California, which was uh, declared to be an exclusive military zone. And then he was asked to get out of the area in view of the war. He was a person who was born in the US, and he said that I have a right to stay here where my house is, and you cannot ask me to get out of this place. But the majority held that in, in uh, the case of emergency, he has to be shifted. But the dissent held that there was a right of dignity for Koramats to, to stay in the area where his house was situated. And dignity was used by Justice Murphy when he wrote this uh, dissent. And thereafter, there were so many judgments of the US Supreme Court. And these were religiously followed by our case from Kharak Singh onwards where those judgments have been referred to for the purpose of holding that a person's dignity cannot be violated. He has a right of dignity which is a value, which is actually covering all the other fundamental rights, and that is inviolable. Though it's not there in the Constitution by interpretation, the court has said that it is inviolable. Why is it that uh, we are uh, dealing with dignity, which is not a constitutional right? It's only because it is not a right as such in India, but it is a value. And where does this value come from? It actually comes from Kant's uh, philosophy where he defines dignity as a quality of intrinsic absolute value above any price and thus excluding any equivalence. And as this fundamental value is what underlies the constitution, Dignity is referred to as a tuning fork or key according to which the rights are harmonized. And uh, dignity being a very important facet of a human individual, how is it the law has developed in various areas? I will refer to a, a few areas which have not been discussed by my friends when they were speaking. Torture, police custody, these were referred to by Mr. Kao. Sunil Batra was referred to by him. In so far as death penalty is concerned, he referred to just a secret statement where he said that every individual till he uh, meets his maker has a right of dignity which has to be protected. I will refer to a death penalty case which uh, came before the South African court. In a case uh, which is Makwanyane, the Supreme Court held that death penalty itself is invalid and it is violative of the human dignity of an individual, unlike in India, where we say that the right is there in an individual which has to be taken care of until he meets his maker. And uh, in respect of treatment of prisoners in jails, in Prop versus Dulles, where a person was tied to the, a pole for about seven hours, not being even uh, uh, permitted uh, to go to a uh, washroom. He went to court and then complained of violation of human dignity. And uh, 
the U.S. Supreme Court held that this treatment was in violation of the Eighth Amendment, and the theme of the Eighth Amendment is that there should not be any excess penalties by keeping in mind that there is a dignity of every human being which has to be protected. And in so far as an equivalent to Sunil Batra is concerned, there is a case which was decided by the German Constitutional Court, which is called Dashna. In this case, a law graduate kidnapped an 11 year old boy and he was demanding a ransom. The police authorities who were investigating the crime were uh, apprehending that uh, the victim might be starving. Three days already uh, passed and they did not know in what situation the boy was. So they threatened Dashna. They said that uh, unless you give us some information, we are going to bash you. We are going to suffer uh, a lot of pain. Thereafter, uh, he revealed, they found uh, that the boy was dead and the kidnapper was um, convicted. But on his complaint, there was a case registered against the chief police inspector and the other inspectors who were working uh, under him for having threatened, of, threatened the accused of physical pain to get some information from him. The court said that this can't happen. And even the police officers were found to have violated the human dignity of the accused and they were also punished. So this is to what extent the court has gone to protect human dignity, even taking into account the status of the person who has violated it in the discharge of his duties. I was also thinking about another case when I was talking to you about how courts have reacted to the human dignity and how it is to be protected when it comes to conflict of rights which I have mentioned earlier. There is a provision in the Air, Sa Air Safety Act in Germany which gives power to the Air Force to shoot down a plane in which there are persons who have hijacked the plane. There are passengers in the plane, but the act gives power to the Air Force to shoot down the plane in larger public interest because hijackers are there in the plane. The question arose as to whether the lives of the persons in the plane are not important and whether a blanket order can be passed by the government under the Air Safety Act to shoot down the plane because they don't want these hijackers to escape in any event. The court held in favor of those passengers and their lives by saying that their lives are important and human dignity was explained in respect of each individual who was uh, traveling in the flight and they struck down the uh, provision of the act. And uh, there is another case coming from the same country in respect of persons uh, who are disabled. There is this game of the walk talking. And uh, the government found that this uh, dwarf tossing is demeaning to these dwarfs. And they said, uh, we don't permit this because uh, this affects the dignity of the dwarfs. It should not be permitted. But the dwarfs themselves were left unemployed. They went to court and then they said that, uh, see, the question of our livelihood comes in. Forget about the dignity. You will have to live. But the court didn't accept what the dwarfs said. They said, no, we cannot permit your uh, dignity to be taken away. You can't be tossed like this in public. And uh, there's another case from the continent where uh, uh, peeping is permitted to see a woman uh, dance naked or half naked, where uh, the question of uh, their dignity came, whether the peep shows have to be permitted. And that also was held to be bad. So they said that uh, this also affects the dignity of persons. But uh, there is a complaint by them saying that we don't have a problem and we are doing it for our, our livelihood. So how is it the courts decide as and when there is a conflict like this between uh, dignity of a particular individual or individuals and other individuals who say that, oh, uh, there's something else, some other right uh, which is at stake. 
So this is why dignity was placed at a higher level than the uh, other uh, rights. Uh, in the uh, recent judgment, Justice Chandrachud uh, said that an individual's dignity is superior to mob morality. This is what he said. I think it is in Sabarimala case. So there are conflicts that would come in about the rights that are asserted, which are guaranteed by the Constitution, and the right of dignity, which is asserted by an individual or a group of individuals. And then the, the judges would be facing this difficult task of deciding which has to be given uh, uh, prominence. How do judges decide these cases? In my experience and from what I read, judges do not, do not decide cases on the basis of their whims and fancies. Judges decide cases on the basis of their understanding of the fundamental principles of law. And they also look into the evolving human standards in the society and then apply the law to the society, which is strictly in accordance with law. Now, there are some problem areas as to whether a judge is confronted with a situation where there is a conflict in interest. And in that situation, if at all, the human dignity is also involved, they might lean in favor of uh, human dignity. The judgments of this court, uh, especially the judgment of right to privacy, is applauded all over the world. The judgment uh, which was delivered uh, declaring Article 377 of uh, the Indian Penal Code as unconstitutional has received great applause, especially the court trying to protect the fundamental rights of individuals. We heard from the audio clip of uh, Mr. Palkiwala where he was speaking about the fundamental rights of individuals which are very important. And from the paragraph of his article which I read out to you as to how close this the rights of individuals is to his heart. Fundamental rights of individuals have to be protected by the judges. In any case, wherever somebody comes and then complains of a violation of uh, a right to dignity, the Constitutional Court would definitely respond in his favor. I end by referring to what is his learned hand said on liberty. He said, liberty lies in the hearts of men and women. When he dies there, no constitution, no law, no court can save it. No constitution, no law, no court can even do much to help it. Let us apply this to personal, the dignity, human dignity also. Thank you.